Good afternoon, everyone. The Biochemical Society and Portland Press are pleased to welcome you to this webinar, which is part of our biochemistry focused webinar series. So topics in this series include different research areas in the molecular biosciences, as well as practical sessions to support career development. Each webinar gives the opportunity to ask questions via text, and we welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers to feature in the series. Please see the website for more details. I'm Ian Collins, Professor of Medicinal Chemistry at the Institute of Cancer Research in London, uh, where I head our chemistry department in the Multidisciplinary Cancer Drug Discovery Centre. I'm delighted to be able to chair this afternoon's session. So this event is part of the Biochemical Society's dedicated early career research programme of webinars, and we're delighted to provide this opportunity today for Louise, Nicholas, Bethan and Deepak to share their work with the biosciences community. Our webinar today is titled Developments in Drug Discovery, and we will hear from these four early career researchers who will share their work in this field. Before I hand over to the first speaker, I'd like to mention that questions will be asked at the end of the webinar when all four speakers have presented. But please do send in your questions by text during the talks. If you have a question, please type it into the question box as shown in the image on the screen, stating who your question is for, please, and we will try to answer as many of those as possible at the end. So our first invited speaker today is Dr. Louise Walport from the Francis Crick Institute uh, London and Imperial College. So Louise obtained her doctorate under the supervision of Professor Chris Schofield and Professor Christina Redfield at Oxford, focusing on mechanistic studies of histone demethylases. Following further postdoctoral work in Oxford, she was awarded a Marie Sklodowska Fury Global Fellowship to work in the group of Hiroaki Suga at the University of Tokyo where her interest in cyclic peptides arose. Since 2018, she's been a lecturer in the chemistry department at Imperial College and also a group leader at the Francis Crick Institute. Her group is particularly interested in developing new approaches to understand the regulation of enzyme-catalyzed post-translational modifications using cyclic peptide-based tools. And today, Louise is gonna to talk to us on diverse binding to a single interface, de novo cyclic peptides as inhibitors of the BET bromo domains. Louise, please give your presentation. Thanks, Ian. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to share with the Biochemical Society community some of our, our recent work. As you heard from Ian, overall, my lab is interested in developing uh, chemical tools based on cyclic peptides, uh, particularly to understand the regulation of proteins involved in post-translational modifications. And so why are we interested in peptides? Well, I think peptides are emerging as a powerful class of drug-like molecule for targeting uh, challenging uh, drug targets, things like protein-protein interactions uh, or members of highly homologous protein families, places where classical small molecules have maybe uh, found it quite challenging. Uh, and this is partly due to their size and dense functionality. So I like to think of them as occupying this sort of a Goldilocks region in space between large biologics, things like antibodies uh, and classical small molecule drugs. And this allows them to adopt favorable characteristics of both classes of molecules. So like biologics, they have really exquisite uh, target specificity and potency uh, and are largely made up of amino acids, so break down to benign metabolites. However, in contrast to biologic, their small size means uh, there's little risk of immunogenicity uh, and they can penetrate tissue and also in some cases cell permeability, uh, though this is more challenging and the manufacturing costs tend to be lower than for biologics. The other reason we like them is there's a lot of really good technologies for discovering peptides. And in my lab, we apply an mRNA display based system called the RAPID system uh, that was developed in the lab of my postdoctoral advisor, Hiroaki Suga at the University of Tokyo. And the RAPID system allows us to produce uh, encoded libraries of peptides with over 10 to the 13 different members that we produce using uh, in vitro translation and genetic code reprogramming. So we can make cyclic peptides with a large number of artificial amino acids in them. And we can take these encoded libraries uh, and select from them uh, type binding pe peptides to a target of interest by using affinity panning with an immobilized uh, protein. Uh, and we repeat these rounds of making our library and selecting uh, selecting peptides until the library becomes enriched uh, in sequences that bind to our target. At that point, we can use next generation sequencing of, of the nucleic acids that encode these peptides to identify the sequence of our hit peptides. And so really in just a few weeks, we tend to be able to go from these trillion member libraries uh, to just a few type binding uh, peptide sequences, often in the nanomolar or even picomolar range. And these libraries are really powerful. You can almost always get hits to proteins. Uh, and what in this study we're interested in understanding really is what the, 
greater structural diversity is in these libraries, whether you have more than uh, one different structural class that combine to a given target. And so really what's underlying the success of these libraries. And we decided to study this uh, in a collaboration with Joel Mackay's lab at the University of Sydney, uh, looking at bromo domains, which are small alpha helical bundle proteins that uh, recognize acetylated lysines. Uh, and we chose to focus on the BET bromo domain family, uh, these four proteins, BRD234 and T, uh, which are transcriptional co-regulators that recognize acetylated lysine in a range uh, of positions on histone tails uh, and in transcription factors. And in so doing, they regulate a gene transcription. And it's found that these proteins are frequently misregulated in cancers. Uh, and indeed, already there are more than a dozen clinical trials ongoing uh, for drugs targeting the bromo domains of these proteins for uh, things like acute myeloid leukemia and ER positive breast cancer. But despite over a decade of medicinal chemistry efforts targeting uh, these proteins, it's been very challenging to get small molecules that can either distinguish between the first bromo domains and second bromo domains of these proteins, or even more so between individual bromo domain ones of a given family. And when you look at this overlay, this is an overlay of crystal structures of three of the first bromo domains uh, bound to one of the archetypal inhibitors here in yellow, um, JQ1. You might see why, and that's because around the pocket that recognizes the acetylated lysine, really all the residues are conserved. So it's been difficult to pick up interactions that are specific uh, to an individual protein. So we wondered whether uh, cyclic peptides might be able to pick up uh, differences that these small molecules have in, and whether because these are quite crystallographically amenable, we might be able to understand how this targeting is coming about. So I set out to carry out three uh, rapid selections against the first bromo domain and the second bromo domain of BRD3, and then also the second bromo domain of BRD4. And what we're immediately happy to see is we've got lots of peptide hits from here, and here you can see just three examples. Uh, where we measured their affinities to each of the bromo domains using SPR. And immediately we could tell that we could get very potent hits. Uh, these are all in the nanomolar or in some really, uh, cases the picomolar range. Uh, and not only are we able to get potency, but we've really got great selectivity. So for example, this peptide here, 3.1b, uh, binds in the sub nanomolar range, the first bromo domains of these proteins, and really doesn't bind at all to the second bromo domain. And that's really a uh, much greater selectivity than been able to be achieved with small molecules. Uh, and not only that, but we're beginning to be able to get some selectivity even within the first bromo domains. Uh, although we've got a way to go before we've got something that hits just a single, single bromo domain here. We also did some commercial assays where they screen these against a wider family of bromo domains. All these proteins are uh, involved here with the yellow circles uh, and red show, show hits for inhibition. And you can see that uh, we're selective not just within the BET family, but also and the broader range of bromo domains. But then the question really arose, how are we getting this? And so we did some structural work, and this was led by a very talented uh, PhD student in Joel's lab, Karishma. Uh, and the first crystal structure she was able to get was this one here with peptide 3.1c. And you can see we have a really nice compact structure with an acetylated lysine that points down into the binding pocket. And when we compare that to the uh, natural ligand here, histone 4, binding to the same bromo domain, you can see that we're really mimicking the same interactions. We have an acetylated lysine in our pocket that's able to uh, pick up the natural hydrogen bond with this asparagine here. And that's very nice, but then it made us think, given this, why are we not getting the same interaction with the second bromo domains, uh, given we seem to be mimicking this natural interaction? So Karishma then set out to try and crystallize these with the other proteins, uh, and luckily she was able to. So for the first bromo domains, you can see we get an almost identical overlay in all three cases, and that's consistent with their similar binding affinities. But for the second bromo domain, to which we bind two orders of magnitude less strongly, we were initially surprised to see that maybe the binding modes looked pretty similar, we're still binding in this main pocket. But when we looked a bit more closely and more distal to the site around the back here from this angle, what we saw that there was another cleft in the first bromo domains formed by this phenylalanine here and the aspartic acid that forms a groove in the protein surface into which we had a second acetylysine sitting picking up interactions. And in those second bromo domains, uh, this phenylalanine is a tyrosine instead. So there's no longer that groove and we lose the interactions with the acetylated lysine, which then points back out into space. So we think these, these interactions distal to the binding pocket are what's giving us selectivity with peptides uh, that isn't achieved if you just focus with a small molecule around this site. So then the question is that, is that conserved motif with all our peptides? And the answer was no. 
So we've got a lot of different things we saw. And the next one we saw was uh, this very interesting bivalent binding mode. So this is a two to one um, mode. And we really think this is a fairly ternary interaction. So on these surfaces, you can see we've got interactions uh, between the peptide and the bromo domains, but also between the two bromo domains. And here how we derive selectivity was clear. Because uh, when we try crystallizing this with a second bromo domain, we see we now get a one-to-one -one complex. Uh, and so we think in terms of drug discovery, this might be another way to get selectivity uh, by uh, trying to make a peptide that binds to the first bromo domain and the second bromo domain of an individual BET protein. The other interesting point we thought was that these are really highly divergent binding modes. The only similarity between our two peptides is that they both have an acetylated lysine pointing down uh, into the acetylmycine binding pocket. And that was a common theme. So we observed a lot of other bivalent binding modes. You can see three here. We also saw uh, helical modes. And I guess it now looks like I'm just throwing structures at you, but it's really to emphasize my main point, which I'd like to make. And I think uh, we think that maybe this has some implication for drug discovery in more general when we think about peptide design. Because if you don't use de novo libraries, another way of, of uh, synthesizing peptide inhibitors is to make something like a staple peptide where you take a, a natural ligand and try and stabilize it. And really there's a lot of uh, structures of bromo domains here uh, with natural ligands all over overlaid. And I don't think we'd have thought these were good candidates for making something like a helical a staple peptide because all the, pe all the natural ligands bind with no secondary structure. And yet when we look at our de novo uh, peptides, what we find is that actually the same interface can bind a whole different set of beta hairpin uh, peptides along the same interface and group, we can also get helices. Um, and so really you've got a single binding surface here that's poised to bind many different secondary structure elements. Uh, and so maybe uh, it, these, these de novo peptides for uh, unstructured uh, binding partners might be good starting points that you could then convert if you wanted to into helical mimetics. Uh, and even if you've got a helix uh, of a natural ligand binding, maybe sometimes you want to think about hairpins as an alternative binding mode. So with that, I'd just like to thank uh, all of my lab members, some of whom you can see pictured here uh, back in pre-COVID days, uh, all of Joel's lab, particularly Karishma, uh, my other collaborators, the scientific technology platforms here at the Crick, uh, all of our funders, uh, and you for your attention, I'd be happy to discuss things at the end of this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise, for an excellent start to our session this afternoon. Uh, just a reminder to everyone listening that questions will be asked at the end of the session. Please send uh, questions by text. And I'd like to thank Louise and move on and introduce our second speaker today, who is Dr. Nicholas Berry from INSERM University Paul Sabatier and the CNRS and Cancer Research Centre of Toulouse. So Nicholas is a senior postdoctoral scientist at the Cancer Research Centre of Toulouse where he implements intracellular antibody approaches to define novel therapeutic strategies against difficult to drug proteins in pancreatic cancer. And today he's presented his work titled The Discovery of Potent KRAS Macromolecular, Macromolecular Degrader Specifically Targeting Tumors with Mutant KRAS. Nicholas, please give your presentation. We can't hear you. Okay, sorry. Now Good. it's better. <laughs> sorry about that. So I'm going to present uh, the work I've done. Actually, I'm working in uh, the at the Cancer Research Center of Toulouse, but I'm going to present uh, the work I've done in uh, Terry Rabbit's group on targeting Kiras uh, with uh, macromolecules. So why we would like to inhibit uh, RAS and KIRAS? Well, RAS uh, proteins are mutated in around 20% of uh, cancers, and it would be valuable to target specifically KIRAS, as it represents more than 85% of RAS mutations. However, so far, most of the current inhibitors target the uh, conserved effector lobe, shown here in wheat color, of RAS, and that's, uh, that uh, that is 100% conserved between the different RAS uh, isoform. Um, therefore, as an alternative, uh, probably targeting the allosteric lobe, which is the other side of the protein shown here in gray, uh, might be a possibility to inhibit uh, RAS function in cells and to reach the isoform uh, specificity. 
So we started the project with, in collaboration with two groups from uh, AstraZeneca, and they performed the phage display selection uh, with a DARPIN library against Kira's uh, G12V uh, protein. So a DARPIN is an antibody mimetic protein that is able to bind antigens or targets uh, inside the cells or also outside. And um, we used that, that uh, scaffold to, uh, to bind uh, Kiras. And what we obtained among the binders, we obtained the DARPIN K19, shown here in uh, yellow with uh, color, that binds Kiras on the allosteric lob, shown here, uh, and the, the, inter uh, the interface is shown is here in blue. So it interacts uh, on the alpha-3, loop-7, alpha-4 uh, region of Kiras, remote from the, the switch region, and it has an affinity of around 10 nanomolar for Kiras, and it's able to bind to Kiras GDP and Kiras GTP. Next, we wanted to check whether this DARPIN could bind all RAS isoform or not. So to do that, we used our uh, bread-based RAS biosensors we previously um, developed. Um, the, these uh, biosensors monitor, uh, monitor RAS protein-protein interaction in cells. So what we observe is uh, in cells, when the DARPIN K19 uh, was able to interact with uh, Kira's uh, wild type, it's the gray curve, but also with Kira's mutant, the black curve, but it's not able to interact with uh, NRAS or HRAS wild type or a mutant shown here in orange and uh, blue curves. So then we wanted to, um, we um, then uh, said that the DARPIN K19 binds specifically to Kira's, and we wanted to check um, how it could get uh, this uh, specificity. So after analyzing the interaction map of uh, the DARPIN on Kiras, we observed that this DARPIN was uh, binding two Kiras specific uh, residues, the histidine 95 and the glutamic acid 107. So we decided to mutate these uh, residues by the one found in NRAS and NHRAS and test the ability of the DARPIN to bind the, to uh, these mutants in cells using the BRET assay. And again, what we observe is the DARPIN K19 binds to Kira's wild type in orange, but also binds to uh, the E107D mutant in black. However, uh, the DARPIN does not bind to the ESTD95 mutants, uh, which means that the K19 binds specifically to Kira's via its interaction with the ESTD95 residue on Kira's. After uh, getting a Kira-specific residue, we thought to engineer it into a single domain-based degrader. So these degraders are ta um, basically our targeted protein degradation uh, that we use with uh, intracellular macromolecule binders. So basically, or an intracellular uh, antibody or antibody mimetic such as a DARPIN is fused to an E3 ubiquitin ligase domain and by bind, when the uh, intracellular binder uh, bind contact its target, this target will be ubiquitinylated and degraded by the proteasome. So we used, uh, after several rounds of uh, optimization, um, I engineered a PAN-RAS degrader by fusing an intracellular single domain antibody uh, that binds to all RAS isoform with an E3 ligase domain, and I've uh, engineered the Kiras degrader by fusing the DARPIN K19 I just talked about with the VHL uh, E3 ligase. Uh, what we've done then is to transduce uh, the cells to express these uh, degraders inside, uh, inside the cells. And we did several cell lines. I'm gonna show you the data for two different cell lines. Uh, one is a Kiras mutant cell line, and the other one, MRC5, is a RAS wild type cell line. We first check whether the PAN-RAS degrader was able to uh, degrade its targets. And what we observe by Western blots is the depletion of all RAS isoforms in, by Western blots in both cell lines and in all the cell lines we've, uh, we've been tested, which are uh, uh, Kiras, NRAS, and HRAS. And uh, then we check the Kiras degrader. So once we induce its expression with uh, the doxycycline, we observe that uh, the key, uh, key RAS isoform only was degraded, but not NRAS or HRAS in uh, all the cell lines uh, we tested. Then we we showed that these uh, both degraders were uh, were able to induce a rapid and sustained degradation of uh, their target in cells. So as you can see here, 
only after after only two hours of uh, addition of doxycycline, which promotes the, the expression of the degrader, we could see a decrease of uh, of Keras protein by Western blot, and that decrease is sustained um, in the time in this as you can see in this uh, time course uh, experiments. Then we wanted to check the effect, the functional, uh, the effect on RAS downstream signaling pathway in these cell lines um, when we express the, these the two different degraders. So what we observed is that uh, the pan-RAS degrader, when it's expressed, uh, inhibits uh, RAS downstream signal, signaling pathway, as shown here with phospho-AKT, which is part of the PI3K uh, pathway. But also it uh, decreases uh, inhibit phospho MEC, phospho ERC, which are part of the MAPK uh, pathway downstream of RAS. And this is uh, we observe this in all the cell line we uh, we've been tested uh, tested regardless of the RAS uh, mutational uh, status. However, what we observe with the Kiras degrader is an inhibition of RAS downstream signaling pathway only in mutant Kiras cell lines but not in uh, here RAS wild type or NRAS or HRAS uh, mutant cell line. So here there is no inhibition of the, of the RAS downstream pathway, even though we are degrading Keras um, in this cell line. So um, the next step was to assess the functional effect of these uh, degraders in uh, the cell line proliferation in uh, 2D in vitro assay. So in the mutant uh, Keras cell line, both Kiras degrader and Panras degrader were able to inhibit uh, the proliferation of that cell line, while in the RAS wild type cell line, uh, only the Panras uh, degrader was able to uh, inhibit uh, the proliferation of that cell line. Finally, we wanted to check whether the, um, uh, these degraders were uh, efficient in, uh, in vivo. So to do that, we uh, made two uh, different cell lines, which are the H358. It's the cell line I showed you that is Kiras mutant. And this cell line is expressing the firefly luciferase to, uh, to be able to observe the tumor cells in the mice. And uh, it expresses conditionally or either the Kiras degrader or the Panras degrader. And each of these cell lines have been, uh, of these cell line have been injected in mice. 18 days later, uh, when the later when the tumor were formed, we started the doxycycline treatment for 20 days, and we measured the tumor growth over the time. And what we observe is <clears throat> day one is when we started the doxycycline treatment. So you can see that the, the group of mice that were not treated, the tumor was still growing, which shown here in a, in orange and in black. Why, when we started the doxycycline treatment, which induced the expression of the degraders, we observe a regression of the tumor growth over the time. So, what we observe during the, in that work and uh, the conclusion is that from a phage display selection of DARPINs against Keras G12V protein, we isolated uh, among the binders one uh, Keras specific DARPIN that has been engineered into a Keras degrader that is able to degrade Keras wild type and mutant proteins, but to only affect and inhibit in vitro, in vitro and in vivo mutant Keras cell lines, uh, mutant Keras uh, cells and tumors. So here we show the proof of concept for the development of uh, Keras degraders as therapeutics that could be implemented to any uh, tumors that, that would uh, have uh, a Keras mutation. So I would like to thank uh, the people uh, from Terry Rabbit's group and the two groups of, from uh, the people from the two groups of uh, AstraZeneca that were involved in, in that work. Thank you very much, Nicholas, for an excellent, clear presentation. Um, as I remind people that we'll have questions afterwards. So I'll thank Nicholas and move on to our, our third speaker today. So that is Bethan Howes from AstraZeneca. And Bethan joined AstraZeneca in 2016 after completing her undergraduate biochemistry degree at Leeds University. And she started her career as a micro, microbiological lab technician working in the quality control op operations, but in 2017 moved into research and development to work as a research scientist in the high throughput screening group. 
And in 2020, after three years in that team, Bethan moved again into the protein science team as a DNA encoded screening scientist. Her main role over the past year has been in the setup and implementation of DNA encoded library screening at AstraZeneca, part of the technology transfer of the Dell um, uh, screening from XChem Therapeutics. So Bethan now works as a senior research scientist in the protein scientist team, um, completing uh, DNA encoded library screening for drug discovery projects and also identifying novel applications for this exciting technology. And today Bethan will present her work in this area. Bethan, please give your presentation. Um, thank you Ian, for my introduction and thank you to Biochemical Society for the opportunity to present to you all today. Um, first of all, I'm going to explain briefly what DNA encoded library screening is. And then I'm going to go on to talk about how we're using it currently in AstraZeneca. So firstly, what is DNA encoded library screening? So DNA encoded library screening is a hit identification approach. Um, and the aim of a hit identification approach is to find hits. So hits are compounds which will bind and modulate um, the activity of a target of interest. And these are either recombinant proteins or cells in vitro. And then these hits um, can be inhibitors or activators against a therapeutic target. Um, Dell screening focuses on finding hits from a compound library um, and we want to find hits which bind to recombinant protein targets. We can then assay these hits to ensure they have the desired mechanism of action um, and these hits can then be developed into lead molecules within a drug discovery campaign and ultimately into drugs which will benefit patients. So the first step um, is to synthesize the libraries. So in library synthesis building blocks are added sequentially to form a compound. As each building block is added, a DNA tag which encodes the associated building block chemistry is also added. As more building blocks are added, so are additional DNA tags. And then the complete compound um, will have a DNA tag attached to it, which acts like a barcode to denote the associated chemistry. This allows us to then pool all these compounds together to form a library. And a library can contain billions of compounds. We then take these libraries and incubate them with the recombinant protein target of interest, which will contain an affinity tag. Any compounds from the library which bind to the target protein um, will be immobilized when we immobilize this target protein and co-captured with it. Any compounds which don't bind are washed off in stringent wash steps. Um, and then we can take what's left and elute it from the target protein. So we elute these bound library members, cleave off the DNA tags, um, undergo PCR amplification to get to a suitable DNA concentration, and then we send this output for high throughput sequencing. The sequencing information can then be decoded to give all the information on the enriched compounds. And it's worth noting at this point that compounds which we find to be enriched must then be resynthesized without the DNA tag for any follow up testing. I'd like to compare this to another hit identification approach, um, specifically high throughput screening. So Dell is just one of many hit ID approaches, and we actually usually run DNA encoded library screening in parallel with others, such as high throughput screening, fragment based lead generation, and virtual screening. But to compare it specifically to high throughput screening, um, in high throughput screening, we use quite a lot of automation um, to screen millions of compounds um, in an arrayed screening approach. So this means that each of the individual compounds in a high throughput screen is in an individual well of a microtiter plate. So in DNA encoded library screening, we don't use an arrayed screening approach, we use a pooled screening approach. And this means that within one PCR tube, we can take billions of library members and our target protein and do the screen in just one tube. For this approach, we only need two megs of protein. Um, and to compare this to high throughput screening, a, a typical high throughput screen can use tens to hundreds of megs of protein, depending on the project um, and the assay developed. In DNA encoded library screening, we also have the advantage of being able to screen, screen 12 conditions in parallel. And these conditions are usually all linked to um, the, the target protein. So the first condition you may have will just be the target protein in isolation. You can then include mutated forms of your target protein or truncated forms. You can also include your target protein with any relevant binding partners. And you can also include some off-target conditions too, to get an early indication of the selectivity of your hits. In high throughput screening, you generally just screen one condition per com campaign. One of the caveats of DNA encoded library screening is that it is just a binding assay, so we only find binders. Within a drug discovery project, you want to find compounds which will bind and then alter the activity, so additional assays are required downstream of Dell screening um, 
to confirm the activity that we have here. Whereas comparatively to high throughput screening, you usually run as a primary um, assay, an activity assay. So you already know a bit about the activity of the compounds you, you find. Um, I want to briefly touch on AstraZeneca's history with DNA encoded library screening. So DNA encoded library screening is a relatively new approach compared to some other HIP finding methods. Um, and at AstraZeneca, we have quite a long standing partnership with a company called Exchem Therapeutics over in Boston. And we outsourced our DNA encoded library screening to them for many years. Um, and this has been a really fruitful partnership. Um, we've able, been able to license many compounds through this, and we've had an impact on numerous internal drug discovery projects, um, one of which is highlighted here. In 2018, um, we actually underwent a technology transfer. Um, and this means that XChem agreed to train us and set up the platform in-house AstraZeneca, and our partnership with them would come to an end. So two years ago in 2019, we began training AstraZeneca to bring this technology in-house. And last year in 2020 was the first year that we had a full year of DEL screening at AstraZeneca. So last year we had three uh, main objectives or applications for DEL screening. The first is a relatively simple um, objective, and this was just to support projects. Um, and by this, I mean the drug discovery projects within AZ. Um, so we were to take our training um, and the methods we learned from XChem, and we wanted to use this to support projects and deliver equity to live projects, which we were successful in doing. We then had two more interesting um, objectives, and I'll touch on these in more detail. So the first of these is multi-target screening, and then the second is process development. So multi-target screening, um, as I mentioned before, we have up to 12 conditions within a DEL screening campaign that we can use. And these are usually used to screen different conditions that are all associated with the same target. But we thought, what if we use these 12 conditions to screen 12 bespoke targets um, in one screen? And we thought of two main applications for this. The first one was to build our internal Protax toolbox. So a Protax, if we look at the diagram here, um, is a two-headed molecule, which is joined by a linker. One of these um, heads is a ligand, which binds to your protein of interest. And the second head um, is a warhead, which will selectively bind to an E3 ligase. The E3 ligase, which then becomes bound to your Protax, can then tag your target protein for ubiquitination, um, and this will cause it to be degraded by the proteasome. So Protax are a really useful tool to degrade unwanted or harmful proteins with very high specificity. So in AstraZeneca, we decided to use DEL screening. Um, we chose multiple E3 ligases, which were of particular interest to our therapy areas, and screened these in parallel. So this meant it was really efficient because they were all screened at the same time. But it also gave us the benefit of being able to use each E3 ligase as an off target for all of the others, which gave us a, an early indication of the selectivity of the hits. Any hits that were identified um, can then be resynthesized without the DNA tag, and this will then form the E3 ligase warhead, and this can be fed into our Protax toolbox. This Protax toolbox allows us to have the materials ready to build specific Protax very quickly, um, and hopefully generate degradation data like um, the example seen here. A second application we thought of for multi-target screening was to provide feasibility assessments prior to starting projects. So usually um, within AstraZeneca, before a drug discovery project is initiated, a lot of validation work goes into assessing the feasibility of the project um, before we put resource into a full drug discovery campaign. So for some riskier targets that have limited validation work, and no tool compounds available, we thought DEL could be uh, an opportunity to assess the feasibility. So firstly, we identified some targets based on um, a defined criteria. And then we took these targets um, and we went into protein production. So we completed expression tests um, for the recombinant proteins associated with the targets. And then we purified any suitable constructs. We then completed a DNA encoded library screen of all of these targets in parallel. And from the data analysis, we're able to get some indication of the drug ability of these targets. So can we find any binders to these? And then also, if we identify any hits um, and confirm these without the DNA tag, uh, we can then feed these back into the project for use as tool compounds. Um, the third objective was around process development. Um, and the process development focuses on some current hot topics in DNA encoded library screening. The first one I want to mention is membrane protein screening. So 
Um, recombinant membrane proteins are notoriously difficult to express and purify in high quantities. And as DEL screening only requires a small amount of protein, um, it's seen as quite a good option um, for getting around the difficulties with screening membrane proteins. So there's this paper that's been published um, in Nature Chemistry last year, and this describes a method for screening membrane proteins on the surface of, of live cells. And this explains some really interesting approaches, um, but it's also got some very specific requirements and bespoke methods. Um, so this adds other challenges if we try and adapt this process, um, but this is definitely something we're looking at bringing in-house. Another area for process development is around DNA binding proteins. So DNA binding proteins are becoming more increasingly common as targets, um, but they come with quite a lot of risks um, in this method. So to try and explain this, within a usual DEL screening campaign, you have your library members, so you have your compound with a DNA tag associated with it. And what should happen is you have your target protein and the compound should bind to your target protein. The problem with DNA binding proteins is that they have DNA binding domains. And the risk is that the DNA tag from your compound might bind non-specifically to your target protein. And this will just look like a hit. So this will be a false positive. And it's really difficult in the data analysis step to differentiate between a true hit and a false positive. One of the ways you can get around this is purifying your protein without the DNA binding domain, but this isn't physiologically relevant and actually not all proteins are stable without them. Um, so what we're currently looking at as well, um, and we have an industrial placement student with us this year, um, is methods to screen DNA binding proteins without removing the DNA binding domain. And then just to touch on some future visions. So one of the main things we're focusing on is really improving the efficiency of this process. Um, the current timelines to get compounds back to project teams is about nine months, but we think we could make this faster. Um, implementation of artificial intelligence and machine, machine learning is one of the ways we're looking into doing this to really decrease some of the, the timelines associated with screening. Um, and we're also always looking for continual method development. I've, I've mentioned a couple of things we're looking into, um, but we want to know how we can screen more challenging targets in more challenging conditions. Thank you very much for um, listening to me today. And I also want to acknowledge everyone who's involved in the DNA encode library screening process. Um, we have a, a team of um, biologists, sequencers, um, chemists, um, and then QBio, and people helping us with machine learning and artificial intelligence. Thank you very much, Bethan, for a really clear and really insightful talk. Just to remind everybody, um, the chat function is open for questions. There's a few come in already. Please continue to send those in. And um, I'll thank Bethan and now move on to our final speaker of the day. Um, so this is Dr. Deepak Balaj Thimiri Govinda Raj from the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research Biosciences in South Africa, where he's sensor manager of the CSIR Synthetic Biology and Precision Medicine Center. So Deepak is an expert in nanobiotechnology, synthetic biology and cancer precision medicine. And he's currently establishing cancer precision medicine uh, as a platform at CSIR in South Africa. And delighted to ask him to give his presentation today on ovarian cancer for precision medicine. Deepak, over to you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity for the presentation. Uh, I'm going to present about um, precision medicine, which is on this approach of using drug repurposing for cancer precision medicine, which we are currently establishing at uh, Council for Scientific and Industrial Research at, in South Africa with the support of our Department of Science and Innovation. Um, and we are going to particularly focus on the cancer called as ovarian cancer and we use synthetic biology approach to enable uh, for drug repurposing in precision medicine. Uh, what is precision medicine? It is far more important to know what person the disease has than what the disease the person has. So it's very important to know um, what person the disease has and that's where the personalized precision medicine approach works. And why we are particularly focusing on cancer is that uh, cancer is, um, is, is one a deadly disease and it's growing in numbers, high numbers in South Africa. And it is expected by 2030, there will be, there will be 78% increase in cancer in South Africa. And ovarian cancer is one of the top 10 uh, cancers for women. And when you compare the cancer in number from between South Africa and across the world, um, it is um, irrespective of the Human Development Index, 
the ovarian cancer in, uh, has a deadly impact across all the populations in all the continents. By addressing the unmet medical need for ovarian cancer in South Africa, we are also able to address the unmet medical need around the world. And also to give the relevance why we are working on ovarian cancer is that ovarian cancer uh, in 2011 was close to 7% of among the female cancer deaths. By now, it has reached as closer to breast cancer and lung cancer with close to 24% uh, in, in percentage of cancer deaths in women. And in addition to that, um, the, there is no cure for ovarian cancer. Although we know that only 5 to 10% of all cancers are inherited, however, every woman is at a risk of developing a gynecological cancer. So it is very important to solve this unmet medical need. There are so many ways to solve this unmet medical need. Um, and cancer having be a guardian knot with complex unsolvable problem, we can either do a, a classical drug discovery approach and solve the problem, or we can use an unconventional approach like Alexander the Great did by breaking the Gordian knot by just cutting the knot by a knife. Such kind of an approach is something we are currently implementing is to use a precision medicine approach by using drug repurposing. So how this approach works is that basically we have a panel of drugs of already approved drugs for all types of cancer and we use patient samples from ovarian patient samples and test those drugs on those patient samples in a 96 or 384 format and see whether those drugs are effective in killing those cancer cells in in vitro setting. And we will further validate, validate those drug candidates uh, through flow cytometry. And then because it's an already approved drug, we bypass the strategy of um, doing clinical trial or xenograft experiments and thereby cutting the time frame required uh, in order to enable patient benefits. And we have three work packages. The first work package is where we do the high throughput drug screening, where we culture the cancer cells in a 384 or 96 well format with already approved drugs, and then identify drugs which are effective in killing those cancer cells in a short time frame. The second approach is to use microfluidics, where we capture uh, cancer cells in in a, in a well with few drugs to identify um, single, single drugs which could be effective in killing uh, drug resistant cancer clones. And the third work package is to study how the tumor microenvironment impacts the drug effects on the cancer cell. And because it's an already approved drug, the potential drug candidates which I identify, we directly go for precision cancer therapy. One of the major advantages of using our drug repurposing platform is that the conventional approach where we, use, where we do drug discovery, it's a long and lengthy process which can take to 10 to 17 years. By using drug repurposing platform where we cut down the time frame by close to five to six years, we uh, enable the patient benefits where the drugs we identify using our, our treatment platform could directly benefit the patients. And also we could expand this to several hospitals and use it for clinical testing. And we have a five-year time frame to bring this platform to a market strategy for the whole South Africa in, in a five-year time frame. Besides these work, we have an additional platform which is called the Synthetic Nanobio Machines Platform which uh, add on support to the cancer precision medicine where we produce uh, pharmaceutical biopharmaceutical drugs using CHO cell expression system and synthetic uh, viral platforms and those drug candidates are tested in, in the, our cancer precision medicine platform in addition we improve the drug efficacy by doing nano formulations using nanotechnology approach and thereby integrating synthetic biology to cancer precision medicine with this, I would conclude my presentation and thank the opportunity for the audience and for the panel members for giving me the opportunity to present the work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dick, uh, for describing your work and a really um, important um, objective there. So um, thank you to all four speakers for your presentations this afternoon. Um, I think the organizers are going to share webcams so we'll all be on screen at the same time. 
Um, and we can now welcome questions for any of the speakers. I have a number already um, to, to look through, but please, if any occur to you during the, the conversation, please um, add those and we'll try and get, fit those in. Um, if I might start, uh, let's see, we're not quite all here yet. <laughs> I was going to, was waiting for Louise to come back online. <laughs> Hello, Louise. Louise, I had one start for you to start with which is I noticed that your BRD3 BD1 peptide had an N-acetyl lysine. So perhaps you could just explain to us a little bit more how you control post-translational modifications on the amino acids in the cyclic peptide library. Yes, of course. So uh, the rapid plas uh, platform we use, sorry, my screen has changed, uh, allows us to uh, reprogram different uh, tRNAs using an artificial ribozyme known as a uh, flexizyme. So actually in the selection itself, I'd swap methionine uh, so the methionine codon instead has an acetylated lysine. Uh, and we actually put made, designed a library so all of our peptides would have at least one acetylated lysine there uh, to kind of target things towards that pocket. That's cool. Thank you. Thank you for, for, for clarifying. That's great. Um, uh, while we're on the subject, um, you also showed the, some interesting bivalent um, binders from your screen, Louise. What do you, do you, are you able to give some in, insight into the where and when that's biologically relevant, particularly in the context of these um, multi-BRD domain proteins? Or is, or is that likely to be a little bit something you can only see when you've got the separated domains present? Uh, so we're actually looking into that at the moment, uh, and I'm not certain of the answer. I think it will be, I think in, in a um, medchem sense, it would be better if we could adapt these peptides so that they dimerized the first bromo domain and the second bromo domain of a tandem pair. Um, but we're starting to try some crossing key experiments to see whether, I mean, I think it's not impossible that they could dimerize, there, there will along chromatin, I think often be multiple copies of BRD3, say. So I think it's not impossible that we would dimerize it in, uh, in a cellular context. It's certainly, we see it in solution. I showed crystal structures, but we've tested and this is definitely a solution uh, uh, structure as well. Uh, so I, I don't know the answer and we're testing that, but uh, I think it could could still be relevant. It'd be interesting to see. Actually, it's a nice way of probing the, the, the relevance of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, some questions for Nicholas, if we may. Um, uh, one of our, 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 our questions we've asked is just could you quickly clarify the, the role of the doxycycline in your experiments? Uh, because the, the, the Internet became a little bit unstable while you were describing the inducible systems. And I think it, uh, one of our one of our audience would like just to, to clarify what was going on there. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, because they are macromolecules, we can't, they don't go inside the cells, um, unlike small molecules or even the uh, cyclic peptides. They don't go into the inside the cell, so we have to transduce or transfect these uh, as a plasmid, so the coding uh, the, the DNA. So we made a, a, an inducible system. So we use a teton system with a, a vi on the lantivirus. So we infect its cells. And when we add the doxycycline, it will induce uh, the expression of our uh, degrader. Thank you. Um, actually related to that, looking forward for DARPIN based or into other intracellular antibody technologies, um, what do you think are the prospects for being able to deliver those into cells having applied them, for example, as an intravenous solution? Well, um, there are several strategies, let's say, to at least two main platforms, the non-viral and the viral platforms. Uh, in the non-viral, we've uh, actually the vaccine for COVID, I would say the mRNA, and it has been already used uh, in the field of uh, intracellular antibodies and so on. The mRNA with nanoparticles in, uh, is one attractive possibility. And on the other end, uh, you have also the um, virus-based. So it's also feasible like oncolytic viruses that would be specific of tumors, of cancer cells. So that would be one way of uh, deliver this kind of, uh, of therapeutics. But it's, yeah, it's ongoing. There is, I think, a lot, of, a lot to do. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so another question, which comes in a couple of parts, but the, the first part is, um, where you selected your DARPIN against KRAS binding to GTP and GDP bound forms. And you've got the same or similar affinity for, for both, I think, in, in the initial um, experiments. And then when you conjugated and linked to the um, components of the Kalini 3 to, to, to get the degrader, 
Did you see if there was any influence of that fusion in the affinity for the different forms of RAS? Um, well, no, we didn't check the affinity. Uh, we just checked whether they would be still be able to degrade. So the, it only degraded the uh, key RAS isoform. Um, yeah, we, we were not able to check whether it would uh, degrading uh, GDP or GDP. We presume most most likely it will degrade all uh, all GTP and GTP uh, form of Kiras only. But no, we didn't check the the affinity of the of the engineered uh, DARPIN. Okay, thank you. And uh, finally, uh, when you, you you perform your selection in the initial library, would there be any benefit in um, creating a secondary library by error prone PCR to see if that leads to a you know mutated form with an improved binding? Could you comment on the coverage of the primary library in terms of finding the optimum binders? Yeah, well, um, yeah, it's 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 something like uh, usually done uh, to it's called affinity maturation, and uh, that's uh, usually done. Um, we were, let's say, quite lucky because it was already quite good affinity of ten nanomolar. But obviously, if you have a, a binder that is really interesting to where it's binding on the protein. Obviously, and but the binding is low. Maybe you, we will have to do this uh, error-prone PCO and uh, affinity maturation step. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I've got some questions for Bethan, if I may. Um, so, first of all, um, is there any evidence that with the on on the DL um, libraries that you might miss some hits just due to steric crowding of the D, DL tag? Um, to the small molecule, and can you comment on the construction of the of the way that the the molecules are actually loaded onto the DNA sequence? Yes. Yeah, so, um, no, the the libraries are designed with they're going to have a DNA tag on them, so that's always in mind when they're designed. Um, it's a little bit out of my scope. I'm not the chemist who designs them, um, but that's always taken into consideration. Um, there is perhaps a limit. We try and limit how many libraries we pull together. So the libraries um, are generated individually um, with billions of compounds in, and then we can pull multiple libraries together. Um, and there is some sort of published um, numbers around what is the limitation around how many compounds you should really pull together um, so that you don't pull hundreds of billions because then you, you may have that in effect. Thank you. Uh, a, a question that um, maybe plays to, to, to other experience you've had with other high throughput screening techniques as well. What are the sort of typical hit rates for DEL against your know, range of targets? And a second question from that, what is the typical translation from an, from the enrichment primary hits through to the confirmed off, off DEL uh, synthesized molecule? Can you comment on that? Yeah. Um, so we routinely, we don't really define a hit rate in DNA encoded library screening because it's a little bit more difficult than in high throughput screening. So in high throughput screening, a hit rate of about 1% or less than 1% is what you would go for. Um, but again, it depends on the size of your library. So if you have 2 million compounds in a library, that's already quite a lot of compounds to then retest. Um, in relation to DNA encoded library screening, we generally resynthesize under 100 compounds. So considering we're screening billions of compounds, the actual rate of how many come through as binders is quite small. And then from that, the confirmation rate is usually less than 50%. So we really get down to quite small numbers from DNA encoded library screening, despite screening billions to start with. Um, but there's quite a diverse set of chemistry in our libraries. The diversity in the DNA encoded libraries is more than that within our high throughput screening libraries. So um, we usually get hits for things and most things do generate some hits, but yeah, the, the hit rate is a bit more difficult to define in DNA encoded library screening. And sort of related to that, what the typical size of the, if you like, the non-DNA part of the of the library, um, I know that one can do fragment screening using DELs, but, but in your experience, what sort of is the most efficient molecular weight range for the loaded samples? Again, it's very hard to put an exact number on that because it completely depends on the target that we're screening. Um, so sometimes we screen complexes, sometimes we screen just individual target proteins, and then I guess the size of the target protein, that can vary from tens to hundreds of kilodaltons. So 
I can't really put a number on that. They're usually they're slightly bigger than your standard small molecule um, because they have multiple building blocks in them. Um, and also they vary. So some of our libraries only have two building blocks to form a whole compound, whereas some have three or four. Um, so again, it varies. Okay, thank you very much. And Deepak, thank you for, for waiting your turn. I might ask you a, a couple of questions. Um, I really am um, taken by your use of patient samples uh, for your for your screening platform. Could you sort of tell us a little bit more about where those samples come from and how you have to process them to get sort of, if you like, uh, cell cell lines that can can be used in this high throughput technique? Um, to answer the first question, um, we get uh, patient samples from uh, Steve Biko Hospital uh, from the from Pretoria. So uh, this platform is basically built, uh, I just also have to give a brief history be before that. So before we started with ovarian cancer samples, we started working with uh, blood cancer samples, um, where it is more easy to access those samples because it's blood, you get a lot of cancer cells, which is fluid, so it's not difficult to isolate, you can just purify them. And we have established that platform with blood cancer samples and done the drug screening already. This was done in, in my previous employer's place in Norway. We have done that. So once we have shown that it is possible to do on liquid biopsies of the blood cancers, now we want to take a step further to do it on ovarian cancer samples. So we try to get um, ovarian cancer tumors invasively, and then we try to uh, break down the primary cancer cells, and then try to do drug screening for a period of 24 hours to 48 hours. It's much more harder than doing uh, uh, blood cancer samples. Mm -hmm. So that optimization is still going on. Um, so once it's fully optimized, then we can reach the stage where we can do a proper drug screening that we have done before on blood cancer samples. And the second thing is, was the question about can we do cell line drug screening? Is that the question? Yes, yes we can do cancer cell cells for drug screening. However, the limitation is that this is a translational platform. So this platform actually has to benefit the patients. So whatever we do with cancer cell lines will just show the platform works in doing drug screening, but it doesn't actually benefit patient setting. So uh what so the eventual benefit comes only when we when we do the patient samples so we can just do drug screening on cancer wearing cancer cell lines and maybe we can identify drugs through the cell lines where those drugs are killing those cancer cell lines and maybe we can narrow down those drugs and test it in patient samples so it is possible to do on cancer cell lines but our main focus is to actually benefit the patient setting great thank you very much well, we're coming to the end of our hour allotted for the webinar, and I'd like to thank Deepak, Beth, and Nicholas, and Louise for staying on to answer your questions, and thank you for submitting the questions. Um, thanks to everyone for attending. And you can continue this conversation online. Um, please follow the at BiochemSoc or at PPP Publishing on Twitter. And if you'd like to know more about this topic, we'll invite you to read some of the related contact uh, from a variety, content from a variety of issues and papers published by Portland Press, um, which have been shared uh, with you by the chat function during the um, webinar. So you may be interested in attending a related online workshop that the Biochemical Society is organizing on the 12th and 13th of October this year, entitled Key Aspects of Modern Drug Discovery 2021. So it's designed and delivered by experts from industry and academia, and the training event will provide a comprehensive overview of the preclinical drug discovery process. So that will focus on small molecule target identification and validation, hit to lead and lead optimization of compounds, as well as preclinical drug development and toxicology. The online program includes lectures, case studies, and small group discussions, and provides also an opportunity for the delegates to engage directly with speakers. There's early bird registration um, by the 12th of September this year, and you can register on the uh, Biochem website. So uh, full details are shown on the screen at the moment. Now, we also welcome suggestions for future topics um, and speakers to feature in this biochemistry focused webinar series. So if you do have an idea for a webinar in 2022, we'd be really pleased uh, if you could submit a proposal um, uh, and you can find more information about the webinars, propose one yourself, and also watch recordings of previous events on the uh, biochemistry.org website. 
So I'd like to invite you to join in the next webinar in the series, which will be entitled Visualizing Translation of Bacteria and Viruses at Single Rate Nucleotide Resolution. And that'll take place on Thursday, the 4th of August at two o'clock British summer time. This session will be chaired by Dr. Betty Chung from the University of Cambridge, and it aims to promote interest in ribosome profiling. And during that webinar, we'll hear from Dr. Alan Buskirk and Dr. Noam stern guinnesser who are prominent world leaders in the study of bacterial and viral translation dynamics and have made extensive use of ribosome profiling in their work. So finally, I'd like to highlight that in these new and uh, sometimes somewhat challenging times, it's more important than ever that we stay connected and engage with our community in biosciences. And joining the Biochemical Society's community of researchers and specialists is a great way to achieve that and to meet with fellow molecular bioscientists in the um, relatively safe space online. And of course, members can take advantage of a variety of benefits, including discounted registration fees for society courses and meetings, exclusive access to a range of grants and bursaries, and personal online access to journals and more. So please visit the Biochemical Society's website um, to uh, find out more about that. And finally, thank you all very much to our attendees and our speakers today. It's been a pleasure to host this event. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.